it's great to be here. I'm going to talk about building command line interfaces in Ruby, but before I begin to set the scene, I'd like you all to cast your minds back 20 years to the year 1993 and one of the most influential scientific documentaries of its generation. I am, of course, talking about that, uh, that masterpiece about cloning, Jurassic Park. <laughs> now, in this film, there is a great scene where four of the visitors to the park are fleeing for their lives from dinosaurs. They're running through the park's visitor center, and hot on their heels are not just any dinosaurs, but velociraptors, the most dangerous predators ever to walk the Earth. Our heroes seem doomed. But somehow, with the dinosaurs right behind them, they make it to the command center of the park. This is where everything is controlled from. Maybe from here, they can put things right. But there's a problem. They can't lock the door. Everything in this park is computer controlled, even the doors. The raptors are right behind them. What are they going to do? Well, Lex, one of the children, she looks around, she sees the computer, and even through all her terror, her eyes light up. And she says, it's a Unix system. I know this. She finds the command to lock the doors, and she saves everyone's life. Now, it's a great film. Nine-year-old me was right on the edge of his seat eating popcorn, really excited. But is it realistic? Is it realistic that someone can walk into a room, sit down at a computer they've never used before, perform a task they've never even thought about before, and do all of it with dinosaurs trying to eat them? <laughs> and the only thing she knew was that it was Unix. She didn't know how to run a park. She didn't know about door systems, but she knew about Unix. Well, maybe with really good user interfaces, maybe that is possible. But her interface was kind of this crazy 3D file browser flight simulator thing. I don't think that's how most of us use Unix. Most of us live on the command line in Unix. So what makes a good command line interface? What makes an interface that makes your user's eyes light up, that makes them say, I know this, this is Unix? Like how, how do we build those kind of interfaces? Well, I'm going to spend the rest of the time live coding one of those interfaces, and we're going to explore two concepts through that. One is the idea of conventions. Conventions are things that aren't enforced by any of the software we're using, but users expect them. Think about the web as an example. Most web pages have they've got a logo. It's kind of up there in the top left corner. And when you click on it, it takes you back to the home page. There's nothing in HTML or CSS that's forcing you to do that. It's just what users expect. And the command line similarly has these conventions. We're also going to talk about rules that govern the way that software talks to other software. Again, if we take the web as an analogy, you know, the user's over here and the web application's over here, but in the middle is a browser. And there's all kinds of communication between the web application and the browser that the user doesn't really see or know that much about. But all of it is facilitating the user's experience of this website. So similarly, on the command line, if we play well with other programs and we play well with the environment and with the shell, then things are going to go better. It's going to facilitate the user's experience. So I've written a Ruby library called Greeter. Um, it's very useful, but very simple. And by simple, I mean it has one class called Greeter, and that has one method called greeting. And when I give it a name, it returns a greeting for that name. If I give it something that doesn't look like a name, though, maybe some punctuation, it raises an exception. It tells me, I don't like that. That's not really a name. So we're going to wrap this in a command line interface. So I've already created a file here called bin slash greet. And in here, I want to require from my greeting library the CLI class. We're going to instantiate one of these CLI objects. Now into this, I'm going to pass argv. Argv is a constant that contains the arguments that are passed into our Ruby program on the command line. I could access this directly inside my CLI class, but that would make it difficult to test. It's easier if I pass in these arguments to the constructor. And then I'm going to call a run method. I don't want to put much code in this file. You know, just because I'm going to be trying to follow conventions that were established by C hackers in the 70s, that doesn't mean I want a big file of imperative code and single letter variable names. So we're still going to use objects here. So let's define this CLI class. I've already got as far as writing an initializer, and it takes those arguments and puts them in an instance variable. But we still need the run method. So what's that going to do? Well, it's going to output a greeting. So we'll use puts, and then we'll use greeter.greeting, as you already saw in IRB. And I'm going to pass a name in there. And we'll derive the name from the arguments. 
So it's just going to be the first of the arguments. So let's see that working. OK, so if I run greet.rb, it will say hello. It really won't. Awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. You've no idea how many times I've practiced this, and I've never made that mistake before, so that's awesome. They told me live coding was a bad idea, and I laughed. Um, OK, we run greet.rb, and it says hello to all you lovely people. So we've written some software. We've even fixed a bug with some help from the audience. Ship it, right? Pull request, picture of a squirrel in a hat, we're done. Um, but remember, our target audience are people who've never used this before, and they're being chased by dinosaurs. So let's try and give them a few extra features. Remember that exception that we raised when you gave it punctuation instead of a name? We still see that here on the command line. Now, this is not following the conventions of Unix utilities. If you run something like the move command with files that don't exist, it doesn't give you a stack trace. It doesn't talk about internals. Command line interfaces are abstractions, and we don't want our abstractions to leak. The user doesn't care that this is written in Ruby or that the error was on line seven. That's not interesting to them. So let's add some error handling. I'm going to do this up in the top level here in the, uh, in the bin file. And we'll rescue any standard error that's going to occur. And then I'm going to follow what I saw MV do. So I'm going to start with the name of the command, just to make sure that if this is in a big log file that it's recognizable. I'm going to label it as an error. And then we'll put the message from the error in there. So if we run this again, now we get a friendly error message. We're no longer leaking details of our underlying Ruby implementation. And if we run it with good input, it still outputs a greeting. But there's one more case, which is no input. Now, this error message is kind of OK. Nil is a bit of a Ruby detail that we're leaking, but we're breaking another Unix convention. Again, let's look at MV. If we run it without any arguments, it tells us how we should use it. It tells us what the required arguments are. So let's go and implement a usage message in our greet command. So up here in the run method, I'm going to say if we have valid arguments, we're going to carry on as before. But otherwise, we're going to output a usage message. What does valid arguments mean? Well, in this case, um, in this case, it means that we have one argument. So let's try that again. If we run greet now with no arguments, we get a nice friendly usage message. So already we've improved a lot from our initial implementation. We're giving friendly errors and friendly usage messages. But we've not thought about rules yet. And, and as it stands at the moment, we don't play well with other programs. Um, can everyone read this at the back? Hang on, let me see if I can make this a bit bigger for you. Uh, greet.rb, pipe it into figlet. How's that? Can you read that now? Um, so using the pipe character in our shell, we can send the output of one program into the input of another, which lets us do really useful things, like make massive banner text. But if we do this without any arguments, we get figlet output for our usage message. That's not very useful. It's not very useful with Figlet, but it's even less useful if I was piping this into something like LPR, which sends it to a printer. You know, walking across the office to pick up a piece of paper and found out you used the wrong arguments is not anyone's idea of fun. <laughs> now, Unix has a solution to this. It gives us separate output streams for real program output on standard out, which is what we're using at the moment. And then for errors and anything else you'd be annoyed to find on a printout, that should all go to standard error. So let's use these output streams correctly. So we're interested in anywhere where we've used puts. And I'm going to explicitly use standard out here for the output, just so that when I come back to this code in six months' time, I know that I've thought about this. And so if another developer picks this up, they know that I definitely meant standard out. I, I wasn't just using puts out of habit. And then for the usage message, I want that to go to standard error. And also, we have this error output in our bin file, and that should go to standard error as well. So now when we pipe this through Figlet, the error output goes to a different place. 
the error output goes straight back to the terminal. But if we run it with good output, it goes through Figlet. And of course, now we're playing well with the shell and we're playing well with other programs, then it's up to the user what they do with this. I can always say I want to, do a, I want to run a greeting and I want to take output stream number two, that's the error output, I want to redirect it into a file, and then the file I'm going to choose is ampersand one, which is a sort of special way of saying, instead of a file, send it to the standard output instead of the standard error, and then I can pipe all of that through Figlet. So I can still get giant usage messages if I want them, but by following the rules, that's not the default thing that happens. Now, there's one other common approach to combining commands that isn't using pipes and isn't combining input and output, but is um, conditional execution. So if I want to output this greeting again to all of you, but I also want to include a welcome message, I can use the double ampersand. Double ampersand on the shell works much like it does in Ruby. If the first part evaluates to true, or in the shell terminology, if the first part succeeds, then the second part will be executed. Otherwise, the second part shouldn't be executed. So let's find out what our greet command does if the first command fails. <coughs> hmm. The echo command still ran. We still get welcome in the output. That's not what we wanted. We're not correctly communicating back to Unix and back to the shell that this has failed. And we do that with exit statuses. So here where we have an error, I'm gonna call exit. And then I need to give it a number indicating what kind of exit this is. Now, in Unix, there's a fairly pessimistic view of the world because there are 256 different exit statuses and only one of them means that everything's okay. Zero means it was all fine and we don't care why. One up to 255 are all for communicating different kinds of error. So I'm just gonna use one here. It's not zero, it'll do. But then over in, uh, in our CLI class, we have this usage message. And this is another case where the command has failed to produce useful output. So we want to exit with a non-zero status here too, but what should we use? I don't want to reuse one, because I've already used that to tell external programs that there was some kind of generic error. So what should I use? I'm gonna use 64. That's not as arbitrary as it looks. There is a manual page called sysexits. Um, if you're a OS 10 user or a BSD user, you'll have this. If you're a Linux user, you're gonna have to Google it, sorry. Um, but this tells you that according to the um, BSD style guide, it's not good practice just to give arbitrary values when ending a program. Instead, you should use some predefined values. And then it goes on to give a list of predefined values. And the very first one there is usage, 64. The command was used incorrectly. Now, most of the time, most people are only going to care about did the command succeed or fail. But sometimes this is going to be very useful, and not just to users of your program, but to other developers who come along later and they're trying to figure out some complex error handling code. If you're using predefined error, um, predefined exit statuses, and instead of just throwing in a magic number like I just did, but using well-named constants, then that's gonna help your code to be more clear and more understandable. Let's go back to Greeter. So now we have good exit statuses. We should be able to run this conditional execution without failing, or rather with failing and with the second command therefore not running. But if we get good output, then the second command will run. So very quickly, we've got to a point where we're obeying some conventions and some rules. We have the convention of having short useful error messages that identify the, the program as well as the problem. We have the convention of, using, um, of giving a usage message, and we're following some rules about exit statuses and output streams. And that's all great so far, but there's still one thing that really bothers me about this command line program. If I run it with bad input, it tells me that dot, dot, dot is not a valid name. When I see this kind of thing, sometimes it just makes me want to flip my desk. I mean, why? Why is that not a valid name? It's not helping me. So where do I go? Do I go to Google? Do I go to Stack Overflow? Well, if you're being chased by raptors, you might want to just stay in the terminal, stay focused, get things done here and now. So the first place I would look would be the Unix manual, but it can't help me. 
So let's fix that. Let's add a man page to this Greek command. Oops. So I've created a, uh, a man page here, and I'm just going to cheat and pull in one that I wrote earlier. Um, the Groff syntax is a little bit unpleasant. Thankfully, there is a manual page about Groff, so the manual can help you edit the manual. But if you were doing this for real, I would recommend using a tool which lets you write some newer syntax and generate your Groff automatically. I wouldn't do what I've done here and sit with the man page and write the Groff by hand. Um, but now this exists, we can look at the manual page. And we can see that, oh, the name may only consist of letters and numbers. Okay, well that makes sense of the error message then. But the manual is about more than just documentation. The manual is also about discoverability. One of my favorite Unix commands, something that I use almost every day, is the what is command, which is search for the manual. Think about git. Git is fabulous and terrifying and huge and powerful and awful and wonderful. It's, it's one of those things that I don't know a single developer who's used Git for a few years without discovering something new every month still after all that time. So how do we discover those things? Well, the what is command can help us out. What is lets me search the manual for anything to do with Git. And I get this giant list of commands. It's all piped through less as well. And oh, less, I know this, this is Unix. That means I can search and I can page through it. And I can, for example, if I want to find the glossary, I can use less's search command look for the glossary, and it tells me, oh, git glossary, there's a manual page for that. Now notice the numbers in parentheses as well in the left-hand column. The glossary is in section seven of the manual, and just after that there's an entry saying git hooks, which is in section five of the manual. When I first started using the Unix manual, I spent a lot of time in section one, which is where you find out about commands, and it makes sense. You know, you type greet, you can't figure out how to use it, so you type man greet, and that's in section one because it's a command. But there's a rich, wealth of manual pages beyond that that describe file formats, that give generic overviews. So I can look at the git glossary and find out all about the different terminology that git uses. This will help me understand the other git manual pages. Now, I have cheated a little here. I've made a manual page very quickly and just gone, aha, it works, look at that. Bundling manual pages with Ruby gems is difficult, very difficult. But I would argue that it's worth it. And several gems have different approaches. Um, I'm not gonna go into them for reasons of time, but I would look at the different approaches that are taken and try to see if you can get a manual page into your command line interface. Maybe you don't want to distribute it as a gem, maybe you want to distribute it as an OS package instead, so that you can take advantage of some of these more Unixy features. And there we have it a command line interface which we can use without having seen it before, maybe. I mean, maybe not, maybe we still need the docs, but at least the docs are there. And maybe, just maybe, one day, this greeting command that I've just created is gonna help someone save the world from dinosaurs. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, my contact details are up there. Um, also, you can get 20% off learn.thoughtbot.com using the code .lb13 for the next week or so. That's all I have for you, thank you.